Good morning. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. And uh, so um, welcome to all of you in the room and also to everyone online. Um, we are um, broadcasting this meeting on Zoom, as you can see. And um, uh, we have a great program today. And before I start, uh, I just wanted to say a few words on, uh, on uh, uh, Grid Arendal and also on the subject uh, of the discussion today. Uh, Grid Arendal is an env environmental foundation based in Norway, and uh, our focus, our main focus, uh, is on the science to policy interface. We transform uh, environmental science. Um, to take or to enable decision makers to take uh, positive action. Today um, is not exactly about environmental science, but more about the science of treaty making. And um, that is perhaps equally important at this stage, given that we are now in the negotiation phase uh, on a new legally binding instrument to end plastic pollution. And I will not address the topic uh, more other than to say that we are, uh, always try to work as uh, Grid Arndal with the um, best available expertise um, to raise uh, relevant and important issues. And uh, in this case, we are proud and grateful uh, for our partnership uh, with the Norwegian Academy of International Law and also uh, Fritjof Nansen uh, Institute, uh, who is uh, joining us uh, online today. Um, and you will hear more from all of them and all our other uh, great speakers uh, shortly. So to those in the room, please continue to enjoy your breakfast. Um, and uh, uh, just also to inform you that once the event is over, there will be shuttles waiting outside to take you back to the venue. And to those online, I hope you are somewhere comfortable, uh, perhaps enjoying your lunch or a cup of coffee. Let me now introduce today's uh, moderator and also uh, one of the co-conspirators of the report, um, co-founder of the Norwegian Academy for International Law, Mr. Magnus Löwal. Magnus, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lars, for that, and good morning, uh, colleagues. Um, also, welcome to everybody here in the room and people joining online to this side event, Emerging Fault Lines, what kind of treaty will we have? Um, as Lars said, my name is uh, Magnus Lovold. I'm with uh, this uh, organization called the Norwegian Academy of International Law, and I will, to the best of my abilities, take you through uh, this event this morning in, in Uruguay, um, Punta del Este. We are, I think, at a historic juncture in global plastic governance. On Monday this week, uh, the first session of the Intergovernmental Negotiation Committee to develop a plastic pollution treaty kicked off here in Punta del Este. The aim of today's event is partly to provide a snapshot update on what has happened so far after two days of negotiation and also to launch this report on the new treaty entitled Crafting an Effective Treaty on Plastic Pollution Emerging Fault Lines in the Intergovernmental Negotiations. We have a group with us of, of excellent speakers uh, both here in the room and online um, including Torbjörn Graf Hugo, uh, my colleague from the Norwegian Academy of International Law, and also Kristin Rosendahl, online from the Fritjof Nansen Institute. I will give them the floor in a minute to introduce this report, but just first, uh, two small rules of housekeeping. So, as you understand this is a hybrid event streamed through Zoom. I'm grateful to everyone who has uh, joined, uh, joined this event online and to enable um, those online to hear what I said. Please, to all the panelists, uh, please speak loudly and clearly. And also, we have only one hour uh, for this event uh, before people will have to go back to the conference center to continue the negotiations. So please, to all the speakers, uh, be as concise and precise as possible when delivering your remarks. With that, I would like to turn to you, Turbjörn. Um, and this report that 
you have drafted uh, suggests as one of the key claims or key observations that the difference between a bottom-up treaty or a bottom-up approach and a top-down approach to treaty making looks to become a major fault line in the negotiations on a new plastics treaty. What do you mean by this and has the statements delivered so far on Monday and Tuesday confirmed or challenged this observation? Over to you, Toby. Thank you very much, uh, Magnus. Uh, very good question. You promised you would give me an easy one, but thanks. Um, starting, starting with the first, perhaps, what do we mean by this? Um, very simply put, uh, top down or bottom up, in my mind, is a question of how you design the core provisions of a treaty, the, the control measures, uh, as is mentioned in, in the potential options paper here at, at your, the conference. Um, and if the control provisions of a treaty are both specific and binding, we would call them a top-down approach. Um, and then if either the uh, specificity is missing or the bindingness is missing, we would call it a bottom-up approach. But we'll get back to that, I think. So, as you say, this, the starting point for this report uh, is that we have observed over the past few years, really, that there has been something of uh, a fault line emerging. We call it a fault line, but it is mainly a description of two camps, two perspectives on how treaties should be designed, and specifically this plastic pollution treaty, uh, where one perspective uh, indicates that uh, the best approach is to have sort of a loose framework, nationally determined actions, country driven approaches, and the other uh, indicating that we need global rules, a common standard of action, a uh, common set of, of uh, uh, rules that would guide uh, the international community in, in tackling this issue. And based on the discussions over the past couple of days, I'd say this fault line is still very much present. Uh, we have heard those statements coming from, from uh, governments uh, in the room. Um, many, surprisingly many actually, in my mind, uh, have been very clear on the need for global rules, uh, even mentioning annexes, uh, going down the list of along the along the value chain of plastics of measures that are required, presumably global measures to tackle this problem. And on the other side, we have some governments uh, that are favoring a more sort of disaggregated or bottom up and some even mentioned specifically bottom up um, country driven approaches. Um, based on understanding of this problem as, as very context specific and that each country is different, which makes it difficult in, in their view to have a clear set of, of global rules. So that in our view, uh, well, that's the starting point for the report. And, and in that sense, it seems to, seems to fit well with, with the discussions that we've seen over the past few days. Is it surprising that this uh, in fault line has emerged? Not really in my mind. Uh, if you look at past experience, this fault line has been a recurring issue for environmental treaties for the past three decades uh, and perhaps particularly so for issues that are perceived to be a bit complex and difficult to tackle such as climate change and, and biodiversity less so for some of the chemical clusters uh, with Minamata, Stockholm, Rotterdam etc. One key point that we make in this report is that the choice between a top-down and a bottom-up treaty, it's not binary, meaning that there is basically no example of a treaty that has only or is purely top-down or purely bottom-up. There will always be some room for interpretation on a national level, uh, so there would, it's never sort of only top-down and all treaties have some sort of, um, um, well, a bit of both, basically. Um, secondly, choice between top down and bottom up depends on how the problem is framed. And what we mean by that is that uh, if, you, if you present the problem as having a broad complex scope, uh, it becomes more difficult to tackle uh, than the likelihood of ending up with a bottom up uh, framework or approach increases because it becomes uh, difficult, more difficult to see where the overlaps are, where the global potential for global rules are. Um, and we've seen this in the plastic pollution issue as well, where some states frame this problem as mainly a plastic problem, a plastic uh, circularity problem where 
uh, which is sort of caused by a range of different factors, a lot of sources, a lot of sectors, etc. And where the only real solution to this is to have a circular economy for plastics in the long run, and where pollution is a small part of that. A very broad um, sort of problem description uh, of plastic pollution. And then the other side, you have governments that present this problem and describe the problem more as a pure pollution problem. At UNEA, we had discussions about sort of the transboundariness of the marine, uh, and then it expanded from that. But still, there's a pollution focus, which makes it slightly easier to sort of look at the causes for this problem, and therefore also the possible potential uh, or the possible response options that could, could be designed to, to respond to it. So that framing has implications for the likelihood of ending up with a top-down or a bottom-up. So what are the pros and cons of these different approaches? Uh, from the perspective of regime effectiveness, the one key advantage of a bottom-up approach is that it's likely to attract broad participation. And that's not surprising either, because if basically any state party can decide for themselves what to do and whether to do it, uh, it's easier for them to accept to become party to that treaty. Um, and another advantage as well, which is linked to that, is that a bottom-up treaty allows for more contexts uh, tailored solutions, right? So you can look at your national context, local context, and say, this is what we need. And then you wouldn't be sort of streamlining everything across the globe. So that's one potential advantage. Um, and then there are also some disadvantages. And then, for instance, the absence of a common set of control measures could complicate domestic policy processes. It could limit opportunities for economies of scale. And it could complicate efforts to monitor, verify, and enforce compliance with the treaty. And I would also say it could make it more difficult to strengthen things over time. And that's uh, a key advantage, or the flip side of that, of course, is the top-down approaches have the advantage of uh, making things clearer from the beginning. And that reduces complexity of the issue, it improves cost efficiency, and it creates a level playing field for business, as we might hear about later in this panel as well. Uh, it could foster innovation, uh, and it would also be, uh, would also facilitate efforts to monitor and verify and enforce. Also, finally, on that point, it could make it, it could add clarity around the requirements of the treaty. Uh, and how that relates to developing countries' uh, need <clears throat> for technical and financial assistance in their obligations. If it's very clear what the control measures are, it's easier to specify exactly what is needed in terms of funding, right? All right. Based on our assessment of the key features of the plastic pollution problem, we end up with a slight uh, or something uh, reminiscent, at least, of a recommendation. And we say that, sort of as, a, as an input to these negotiations, uh, that we believe there is merit in considering both approaches. That plastic pollution as a problem has certain features that reminds us of the climate change problem in terms of, of uh, regulatory complexity, for instance. Uh, but it also has certain features that uh, reminds us of uh, a pollution problem, and that there might be merit in considering both types of measures in in this treaty, but we would caution against ending up with a treaty that has no common control measures, uh, as that is likely to make things difficult to gradually strengthen. And based on experience, as we will hear hopefully later, uh, it's likely to make the treaty less effective over time. With that, I pass it back to you, Magnus, and we'll see where this brings us. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so very much for that, Toby. Um, interesting presentation, um, and we will have a chance to discuss some of the observations and the claims and these arguments in a panel discussion in a minute. Um, but first, I would also like to introduce another of the co-authors of uh, the report, Kristin Rosendahl from Fridtjof Nansen Institute in Oslo. Kristin is joining us online. The people in the room here can see her 
on the screen. I hope you're doing well in, in Oslo. Christine, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. Now, I um, wanted to ask you that uh, Toby here, he mentioned that the report is based on the academic field of regime effectiveness theory. And also Lars, in his introduction, talked about there being sort of a science of treaty making. I know this is a field that you've you have, you have worked on this uh, for, for, for a long time, and I wanted to ask you, what is really regime effectiveness theory? How may it help us in our efforts to craft an effective treaty on plastic pollution? And what are really the key lessons that you think it would be useful for the negotiators of this treaty uh, to keep in mind while they pursue their negotiations? Over to you, Kristin. Thank you so much, Magnus, indeed. What is our rationale for making this assumption that regime theory could uh, provide us with lessons for the efforts to establish an international treaty on plastics? So um, just a crash course in uh, political science then. Um, <laughs> essentially, we all probably agree that and know that the international relations take place in uh, a state of anarchy. And uh, we don't have a single authority to dictate how states should behave for the common good. So how then should we set about to achieve more effective cooperation, to resolve our common global problems and challenges? Well, regime theory scholars also have the same assumptions that the international system is basically dominated by sovereign states, their interests, and also their struggle for power. But then over time, there is actually quite a lot of evidence that states are indeed able to improve their collaboration. And uh, studies have shown that through learning and repeated meetings, it is possible to build trust in common norms and rules for treaty negotiations, and the incentives to cheat can be reduced as the value of reputation is also enhanced by meeting several times. And the flow of information can also be improved, again, making it more likely to build on agreed scientific knowledge. And these items all have institutional elements, which unlike structural power can be modified and can be designed. There's transparency, there's decision-making procedures and how to integrate scientific knowledge. <clears throat> so in effect, regime scholars have examined how improved institutional design can help maximize effective collaboration and in turn effective implementation. I'll just give you one example to conclude. There is much evidence of the crucial role of science and knowledge in the establishment of international treaties at different levels. In our report, we have examined the impact in terms of effectiveness um, but I just like to remind us that knowledge also has practical impl implications in terms of equity, in terms of legitimacy. And uh, the best example, I think, is uh, that of uh, ozone and the Montreal Protocol. The international community would probably not have reached such a high level of agreement without the development and, and then application of substitutes for ozone depleting substances. So the equity aspect here is also known as technology transfer. So I think that the next bulk of lessons that we should be looking into is to in investigate the state of, of technology and also the scope for technology transfers in the further process. So that's all for now. I think uh, Tullibjörn also wrapped up quite a few of uh, the, the central uh, lessons. So I'll just leave it at that and uh, we'll return to it in the discussions. Thank you so much. Really brilliant. Thank you so much for that, uh, Kristin. I think it's very interesting that there is this field of research on, on regime effectiveness. And I think that sometimes maybe that, that field of research, it applies to treaties and processes that have been already concluded, sort of looking back and see what worked and what ended up being effective. I think it's very interesting as an exercise to look at how can these lessons learned and these general conclusions be applied to this, you know, treaty making process that we have now started here and see 
how can we let those lessons inform how we design this treaty. Thank you so much uh, again, Christine. It's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, our other panelists, and we have with us here uh, Daniela Garcia from the Permanent Mission of Ecuador to the UN in Geneva. We have online uh, Michi Oe, who's Director at the Ministry of Environment of Japan. We have Jody Russell from Nestlé, Tricia Farrelly from Massey University in New Zealand, and Andres Del Castillo from Center for International Environmental Law, CL. Thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate that. I'd like to turn first to you, Daniela, if that's all right. Um, the report here, it notes that in order to craft an effective treaty on plastic pollution, a treaty that, in fact, will help us solve this problem, there will be a strong need for leadership. And it highlights some of the different forms of leadership uh, required. I understand that in the field of regime effectiveness, leadership is um, a somewhat contested concept, but at the same time, I think it, from a pract practical perspective for us, in the room, it is absolutely crucial. So I wanted to ask you, how can we, in your view, foster the kind of leadership required to ensure that the negotiations produces indeed an ambitious and effective treaty? Thank you very much. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Magnus, I just wanted uh, to start by thanking uh, the organizers for this uh, kind invitation to Ecuador and this uh, great um, event uh, joining a, a great experts in this panel, so uh, we feel very honored to be here. Um, and leadership, um, I will talk about, I always, we always talk about leadership and inclusivity uh, being together uh, with ambition as well as uh, complementary concepts. Um, so just to go uh, to what has been a, or a experience uh, with uh, including or positioning plastic pollution, the fight uh, uh, to plastic pollution in the international agenda. Um, I will start by saying uh, uh, developing countries and developed countries uh, have been uh, working uh, on this for uh, more than a decade from the inclusion of uh, this, uh, of a reference in the Rio Declaration, uh, Ecuador presented uh, actually on behalf of developing countries uh, this proposal. Uh, years ago and uh, it was successful uh, then the work uh, to uh, for, for for a reference also to be considered in the SDGs uh, uh, in September 2021 uh, there were 70 countries uh, from uh, diversity of uh, levels of development and uh, uh, different regions uh, endorsing a declaration a political declaration showing um, they wanted uh, global <clears throat> rules uh, uh, and uh, this gave a political push also to later on adopting the resolution uh, in Nairobi uh, presented uh, both by Peru and Rwanda both um, uh, great countries that did a great work also uh, then uh, uh, guiding to the adoption uh, so uh, leadership from a diversity of countries has been present uh, all along uh, the process and uh, for many years, and it has been um, a continuous work for leadership that couldn't have been there without inclusivity, without the diversity of countries that are there. So uh, just uh, linking those uh, two important uh, concepts leadership depending on inclusivity and the effective participation of developing countries. And I will emphasize there uh, a small island developing states. Uh, it was just to mention it was Fiji. And then we are always saying it was Fiji or Ecuador who was the first presenting, uh, presenting the idea um, of, of a treaty. This was already uh, being said uh, by, the, by stakeholders and by the civil society. There was already a recognition for uh, uh, obligations. Uh, international obligations, but then it was presented by a state. So we need a state uh, a treaty. Uh, treaties are applied by the states, and then we need the participation of a stakeholders, of course. And then I go back to uh, what um, what's the experience we need to take. Uh, there is a lot of experience from Basel, Montreal. It was a great mention. Uh, uh, Stockholm, um, Rotterdam, uh, but also uh, Minamata. 
So we need to learn from there as well. Uh, uh, and for uh, I was just to, to, to add to this, uh, I was gladly surprised uh, by uh, all the interventions. As uh, Toby mentioned, uh, there was a recognition uh, that has been already a recognition, and that's why we're here uh, now of the need of uh, global rules guiding uh, the international community to tackle uh, this problem. Uh, so many, many governments uh, already mentioned this uh, uh, during this uh, plenary, but has been has been coming uh, already for, for, for a while. Uh, so um, the kind of leadership that we need is uh, uh, an inclusive, uh, diverse, uh, working together uh, countries. And I have uh, a really, uh, um, we have been uh, keep working together towards, towards an effective treaty. Of course, uh, coming back to the uh, global rules, there they are. We see them as complement. Uh, we see national plans also as complementary to the global rules, but there is a huge recognition already uh, for, for this. Um, so I will stop here uh, and thank you very much again uh, for this kind invitation and uh, thanks to all. Thank, thank you so much uh, for that, Daniela. And I think when you read the accounts of how treaties were made in the past, if you read the accounts of how the Montreal Protocol came in to be or the Minamata Convention, you really see you know, in the narratives how extremely important particular individuals or particular individual states can play in these processes and sort of their willingness to stick their neck out and, you know, lead these efforts. And I think from that perspective, knowing the leading role that Ecuador has played in this process so far, really thank you so much uh, for, for, for that. Uh, I think it is absolutely critical. I'd like now to turn to, um, to Michi, who's joining us online. Thank you so much. Um, uh, for that. And I wanted to go back to that key distinction that Toby here highlighted in the report between a bottom-up treaty on plastic pollution on the one hand and a more classic, if you may, uh, environmental treaty with, with more specific and binding core provisions. In light of what has been said now during the first two days of negotiations, are there, in your view, um, ways to develop a treaty that combines a bottom-up and a top-down approach. Is it indeed possible to get the best of both worlds? Over to you, Michi, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Magnusa, for your kind introduction and the question. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Thank you. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's pity for me that I cannot attend uh, this meeting uh, in person. Uh, although I'm, I'm, uh, I am in uh, the rest uh, But anyway, uh, thank you very much for your kind uh, invitation to this event, a very informative event. Yes, uh, my answer to the, your question is yes. Uh, the global treaty covers full life cycle of plastics with a view to ending plastic pollution. As the scope is very wide from up the upstream to downstream, we have to seek for any types of measures uh, something mixture of top-down and bottom-up approaches, uh, rather than purely top-down or bottom-up only uh, scheme. I agree with previous speakers that we can learn a lot from uh, existing com conventions such as Minamata, Stockholm, Rotterdam, Basel, and this agreement on climate change. Uh, from the viewpoints of Japan, uh, the global instrument must be joined by all countries, especially countries in Asia, which are large uh, producer, consumer, and emitter of plastics. According to reports by uh, UNEP and OECD, about half of uh, global plastics are produced, consumed, and emitted from uh, Asian countries such as China, India, Indonesia. In Japan, a huge amount of marine litters come from surrounding Asian countries to beaches and the coastal areas which causes social and environmental problems. So that is why we are quite eager to engage Asian developing countries in addressing this issue, uh, such as uh, proposing the Osaka Blue Ocean Vision Agreement and shared by G20 and more than 80 countries. Uh, as one of bureau member in Asia Pacific region, Japan have been discussing with Asian countries here in Punta del Este 
and know that the situation varies country by country. In many countries, uh, proper waste management is the key to address the plastic pollution. And uh, most of them are already taking domestic actions on that issue to address that issue. So may, and many countries wish to have the global instrument based on their domestic actions and do not prefer to have a top-down types, bans and regulations. So it's a reality and we need more discussions uh, on that point. And lastly, I just want to touch upon a, a Paris Agreement uh, because I was involved in its negotiation several years ago. Uh, many people think uh, Paris Agreement is taking bottom-up approach, but I think uh, Paris Agreement is a good example of the mixture of top-down and bottom-up uh, approaches. It's, it's uh, sure that uh, nationally determined contribution is the core of the Paris Agreement, but at the same time, it has a top-down global objective of 1.5 degree goal and several schemes to ratchet up countries' efforts towards the top-down goal, such as uh, global stock take and the following updates of NDCs every five years, as well as uh, periodical reporting and uh, assessment of countries' action. In the Global Treaty on Plastic Pollution, uh, National Action Plan will become one of uh, important elements, but not only is not enough. Learning from Paris Agreement, uh, we need a clear goal to be shared by all countries and some mechanisms to ensure that uh, countries' action uh, properly undertaken and improved in a uh, transparency manner. Um, I stop here and uh, I thank you again for your uh, very informative event today. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks very much to you. Um... That is, that is extremely um, uh, interesting. Really appreciate your, your considerations there. And I think it also confirms what, what uh, to some extent, what, what Toby said in his initial presentation, that this choice between a bottom-up and a top-down approach to treaty making is not really a, a, binary, a binary choice. And I guess it also begs the question of whether the distinction initially is uh, useful um, uh, as a sort of an analytic category to describe the dynamics in the, in the room. And I would actually like to ask you, Toby, later on in this event to, for your reflections on that. Um, I would like now to, to turn to um, you, uh, Jody. Um, how does this look like from a business perspective? I know that, of course, you have been involved also in this process for quite some time and you are very much invested in the negotiations that are now taking place in Punta del Este. Will a top-down or a bottom-up treaty, in your view, enable you to better implement the policies required to solve the plastic crisis? Over to you. I don't think we can... It's on now? Yeah, now okay. we can hear you. Fantastic. Um, so thank you for the question and the invitation to share our views. Um, I'll start with bottom up and then I'll go to top down. Brilliant. So if we look at bottom up, um, to us, that looks a lot like the world we live in today. So I'll share some numbers with you. We operate in 186 countries and we do our best to track not only with the local compliance side, but also from a global policy monitoring side, how the packaging landscape is evolving. So I'll, I'll share these numbers so you can see um, what have we tracked because there, there's no official database. And so we, we attempted to build one. So in extended producer responsibility, there are 58 national laws that are in, in force, nine that have been passed and are pending enactment and 37 draft laws that we're attempting to absorb and see in effect, are they putting forward a rigorous framework that ensures when we pay an extended producer responsibility fee, that that fee is adequate and appropriate to cover the collection, the sorting, and the recycling of our packaging material. Um, in reuse and refill, there are 18 national laws and six in draft form. And in deposit return, 31 national laws, 11 that have been passed in our pending enactment, and 22 draft laws. Um, these numbers are increasing rapidly, and it creates a very complex three-dimensional matrix of compliance. So we need harmonized regulation, and we don't have it today. Um, not just us, but 
other consumer goods companies as well, because we're all in the same challenge as users of packaging who are looking to comply with every national law. And there are significant differences between countries. Um, in terms of voluntary action, we've done quite a bit, um, along with others in industry, to showcase what could a better system look like. Um, we've worked with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation on voluntary reporting. There are about 500 companies that participate, unfortunately only 500 companies, um, reporting on our footprint, committing to virgin plastic reductions. We're on track for a 30% reduction by 2025, um, phasing out difficult to recycle materials, and also redesigning our packaging for recycling systems. Uh, today we're at 80% of our pl plastic packaging designed for recycling after significant effort, and we're on track to be above 95% by 2025. Um, if we look at it from the top-down perspective, top-down would offer us cost efficiency. It would also level the playing field across the industry because today, doing the right thing by moving all plastic packaging to design for recycling, supporting collection systems, communicating about this to customers, this is entirely voluntary. And unfortunately, there aren't the thousands or millions of companies with us that we'd like to see um, doing this. So a specific and binding treaty that would end this voluntary patchwork of efforts and start to harmonize all of these different national regulations which continue to grow and frankly we, we commend the effort that national legislators are doing everywhere trying to address this challenge but we recognize it's a systems problem it's extremely complex and we need some top-down harmonized legislation brilliant thank you so much that is that is all very clear and I think it also corresponds well with with, with some of the observations that were made 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 in in this report that it indeed there is already a lot of bottom-up activities, initiatives going on. And then, you know, the question is, what is the purpose of being here in Punta del Este, coming together in a multilateral space to agree on, on, on a treaty? And whether that is there anything that we can add, given that setup, to what is already happening? Thank you so much. Super, super helpful. I want now to, to bring in another uh, panelist. Uh, Trisha here, you took part um, in the in the UNEP expert group uh, on, on marine litter and, and, and microplastics and you've also been nominated to the Associated Scientific Advisory Committee uh, last year. You're a member of New Zealand's National Container Deposit Scheme Working Group and you've co-edited co a book on plastic legacies, pollution, persistence and politics, among other many other things. Uh, really happy that you could join us. Uh, in your view, and in light of your research, including on regional responses to plastic pollution, would a top-down or a bottom-up treaty on plastic pollution have the greatest chance of actually making a meaning of meaningful contribution to, to solving this plastic crisis? And I also wanted to bring in that other question, whether the distinction is indeed useful to describe what we're seeing here in Punta del Este in terms of the dynamics of the negotiations. Over to you. Yes, and I, I, I'd like to speak also directly to the Pacific Island situation as a, as a, as a context, that, or a concrete context perhaps we can hang on to. And I think um, many of us were, were touched by the interventions made, for example, by Palau and, and Marshall Islands, who are really feeling um, firsthand, uh, you know, the impacts of plastic pollution. And so I want to speak to their policy frameworks, which uh, we've done some research around. And, and, and what we determined was that you know, actually Pacific Islands have got quite uh, quite good um, frameworks for plastic pollution, at least to the, the, the best extent um, that they can, uh, given their capacity uh, and given the fact that they don't produce plastic polymers, they don't manufacture um, plastics to any significant extent, and yet they are absolutely um, overwhelmingly impacted by plastic pollution. And so this comes largely through, um, you know, tidal flows, it comes through atmospheric flows, uh, it comes through tourism, and it comes from importation significantly. They have very little control over any of those flows. Um, and so they're trying the best that they can through what we would now refer to as, you know, strengthening our national action plans to deal with that basically at the, the, the bottom the bottom of the pipe. Um, that's not going to work for them. It doesn't work for them. And the status quo isn't working. The bottom up approach hasn't worked, won't work. And um, what they're really calling for, they're desperate for, is global cooperation, um, largely around, um, for example, you know, just to reduce 
um, the amount of, uh, of plastics produced in the first instance to, um, to clean up or to um, reduce the, the number of polymers and the, and the kinds of plastics they're receiving. Um, that they um, have choices around what they accept and what they don't. So trade agreements are also another thing. So I think the global, the nature of global markets um, just screams out for a top down approach, but also a bottom up approach. And I want to speak to as well, you know, the idea of um, the you know, common but differentiated responsibilities. I think everybody has to play their part. Um, primarily through top down, I think, but also through bottom up. But if countries like the Pacific Islands, the Pacific Island region, again, where they have no control over the top flows, um, they will need to play their part absolutely, but they will need to probably be given extra time to play their part to meet their obligations to the treaty. And that will also require technical assistance, capacity building and financial assistance to do so. And if I can put my science hat on again, just for a moment too, um, we'll be need, uh, you know, other science hat, this is social science, but other science hat, we will need harmonized, you know, standards are going to be very important. So standards not around, not only around product design, not only around EPR and management and so on, but we will need also to have um, um, the, we will need to have a harmonization around definitions, but also standards for monitoring, evaluation and reporting um, to assist Pacific Island uh, to, to, again to meet their obligations. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And I think that's a, you know, the, the, that perspective, how a, how a, how, how a treaty um, may, you know, enable some of those countries that are very much on the receiving end of plastic pollution that by being here in Punta de Lista have an opportunity to also address some of the causes of that, that pollution, causes that may find themselves in countries far removed from where the pollution ends up being impacting communities and, and livelihoods. So that is, and, and then, you know, but that, that to some extent warrants a, a more of a top-down uh, approach to, 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 to the treaty. Um, thank you so much for that, uh, Trisha. And I want to bring in our, uh, our final um, um, panelist, uh, Andres, from, from CL. And really also would very much like to, to hear from you on this distinction between bottom-up and top-down to, to treaty making. I, I know, of course, that CL, you have submitted many papers to this, these negotiations, very good papers, um, one on, on how uh, other environmental treaties uh, are structured. And based on this, should I know also that you have strong opinions about what this treaty should, should contain, and should negotiators, in your view, aim for more of a Paris Agreement style bottom-up treaty based on national determined contributions, or more a sort of a classic treaty inspired by uh, the Montreal Protocol, the Stockholm, or, or the Minamata Convention? And, and and why? Over to you. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. And also, we have a long day ahead. I, I will try to pass only two main messages on features that are important in, in a treaty, whatever is bottom up or the other way around. That is this concept of flexibility. And this is one of the main concerns of many governments is Flexibility is one of the conditions for states to accept uh, the content of a treaty, then adopt and ratify, right? And we say one of the only ways to do it is through a bottom up. No. The other way around shows with some features that it's possible to be flexible with uh, dedicated control measures for uh, all the countries. And we have some examples and uh, on that, we need to find catchy names and learn from you for the reports that we produce. <laughs> the name of the report that we produce is called Typology of International Agreements. Already with the title, you don't want to read it, but it's a nice, it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice, um, and go in the same line of your report and kind of go up to, we get um, to the same conclusion that is this idea of flexibility um, is linked with schedules or timing on when an obligation become an obligation or mandatory, specifically for seats or developing countries that are concerned about how they will to adapt to the to comply with the rule that is in the treaty, right? 
And here, uh, there are some features from the Montreal Protocol um, that are important, like uh, having a dedicated fund that supports incremental cost for the, um, for the countries that are parties to adapt easily to the new technology or the new provisions that they need, right? And also for business, this possibility of timing uh, is important for them to say what is what we need to do, but in the future, not now. So um, I will give an example for when we regulate plastic as a material that will be important and plastics as a product. Plastics as a product, everybody agree that one of the main vectors of the crisis is single-use plastics, right? And single-use plastics, uh, we can divide between sectors and application of single-use plastics. And we agree, but all the legislations has uh, like use a negative list, many like listing what are the bad plastics. And this is important for privatizing, but uh, is not effective. And we show because we are in the, in the middle of a crisis with more than 100 regulation on single-use plastics, right? And, but what if the treaty has a specific obligation of banning single-use plastics, right? And many countries say, no, this is not flexible. You know, we already have legislation with, with a negative list. And we say, yes, but you have time five or 10 years to adapt to that goal. And we have models on, on the London Convention to, that pass because it was not effective from a negative list of what are the things that uh, need to be banned to a positive list saying everything that is single use plastic is banned and a positive list with the idea of what are the only exceptions that are a law. For instance, for, we can think in some sectors like uh, the health sector right, or some applications on some circumstances with COVID. People say, oh, we can't live without a mask and things like that. But in that case, you give the prerogative to the states to say, okay, in the specific emergency cases, you have the possibility to, you know, to allow single-use plastics. But this approach, I guess, for the theory could be really interested and then combining with this timing obligation. Second is uh, adaptability. And adaptability is also important. Um, Flexibility is more vis-a-vis -vis states and adaptability vis-a-vis -vis the time. And this is a treaty that we hope will remain for the next uh, 50 years, 100 years, but we need to, um, to have something that can be adapted uh, easily, but also consistently. And the Montreal Protocols give you an answer to that, and is adjusting and amendments. Amendments, almost all the treaties have these possibilities of amendments, but the adjustment is something interesting because when the uh, governing body decides something, you apply that directly, straight, without passing through internal ratification processes that can delay the, the effectiveness and the response of governments. So this is a, a feature that they wanted to, to, to highlight that also is important for adaptability. And uh, the last one will be on the idea of annexes and protocols. And we see in the MARPOL, for instance, that you have some specific annexes that are mandatory and others that are non-mandatory. Uh, but also on the Barcelona Convention, you have these specific um, divisions of the obligations by uh, annexes and by protocols. But then you decide uh, the country that ratified the treaty need to decide at least to ratify one of the, uh, of the annexes. And that also tied this idea of that annexes and protocols uh, are not just decoration, but also um, give the possibility to states to prioritize where are they better now. Or, you know, an annex of microplastics, for instance, needs to be mandatory, right, as a priority. But there are some other annexes that we can give the flexibility to governments to decide when to when to enter or not, right. Thank you. Oh, brilliant, thank you. Can I just ask you very quickly follow up because I know that you have been following and monitoring what has been happening here, uh, not here in this room, but in the conference center where negotiations are taking place. Where are we going? Are we moving in terms of what the statements that have been delivered and in, from your perspective, are we moving towards that vision of a you know, treaty with more specific and mandatory core provisions or what do you see as sort of the, the future tra trajectory here? Yeah, so we, we see two, 
two approaches. One approach will be like national action plans as the, as the main legal feature of the plastic treaty. And national action plans is not the point for a treaty. We're spending a lot of millions of dollars to organize meetings, to gather together, to discuss a treaty, to go to the conclusion that national action plans is the best option. And the other, the other side is specific obligations, control measures, and of course, flexibility and adaptability um, and a specific conditions for seats and developing countries too. So we're in the two camps, but today we're going to have more substance on, on where we're going to go. All right, brilliant. Stay tuned. And everyone here will, of course, monitor that. And I think also the entire negotiations, I mean, at least the plenary sessions, the open sessions are all streamed online. So even people that are not in Uruguay are, are able to, 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 follow, to follow this. Thank you so much for that, um, uh, Andres. Really useful. I would like now to go back to the presenters, the authors or co-authors of this uh, report. Um, uh, to you first, Toby. In light of what has been said so far, I think, you know, has it, you know, the, this discussion, has it challenged or uh, your, in any way, some of the observations or arguments or assumptions that, that you make in, in this report? And I wanted to ask you maybe specifically, um, as indicated earlier, whether you, in light of what you've seen happening and this discussion that we have here, where do you think indeed that this distinction between top down and bottom up is useful? Top down can indeed sound a bit scary, right? And it sounds like there is no flexibility, although as Andres argued here, that it's possible to build in flexibility even with a top down treaty. So just wanted to have your final um, uh, sort of reflections based on discussion here. Over to you, Toby. <clears throat> Thanks, Magnus. And I, I, on your last point, I think, I think you're right. Uh, the top-down uh, approach does have a bit of a communication problem, uh, and maybe those who favor that uh, type of approach might have to do a bit of brainstorming on, on finding alternative ways of describing those uh, specific and, and binding uh, core provisions. Uh, based on the discussion of the past hour, uh, I would say that the report is uh, it largely confirms uh, our assumptions in the report that you know these these are the perspectives that we're trying to pull up there are pros and cons and benefits drawbacks with the different approaches and at the end of the day a treaty will need to be designed as a tailored response to a specific problem right so we have to start by analyzing what is the plastic pollution problem what are the causes of this and how do we design tailored solutions to those causes? But in searching for those solutions, I think it's important that governments consider options uh, that are both harmonized and that might need to be, well, starting from that and then going down and see, we might identify parts of the problem, we probably will, that are difficult to regulate or harmonize and where local national solutions will be needed. But maybe that doesn't even have to be part of the treaty, it could be deferred somehow. Um, I think also going forward that it will be important for governments recognizing that this is a complex issue to prioritize. And one way to do that is to try to, to disaggregate the problem a bit, split it up into more manageable pieces. You can do it by sector, you can do it by pollution category or by value chain step. But by doing that, you can have pieces that are easier to regulate and it allows you also to say okay this is the most important part of the problem or the urgent part of the problem where the pollution risk is the highest or this is a part of the problem that's really easy to fix we could do it in two days let's do that as well and that allows you to start prioritizing and that fits well with the perspective of gradual strengthening because then you can do as much as possible over the next two years two years is a very short time in in the history of diplomacy and then you create a plan for gradually going sector by sector, pollution category by pollution category, until we reach at some point in the future, a point where we've captured all of it. I'm not sure I answered the question, probably not, but I'll hand it back to you anyway, Magnus. I think that was pretty good. Thank you so much, Toby, for those, those final re uh, reflections. I would also like to bring in Kristin here again for some final, uh, final reflections before we close the meeting. 
And uh, Kristin, maybe I can ask you, first of all, on your, I hope you have been able to hear what has happened here in, in the room and that the sound has been okay. So to have your, your, your final reflections would be greatly appreciated. And maybe also to ask you what we can do to ensure that these lessons learned from regime effectiveness theories, what we can do more to ensure that these are taken into account in the negotiations that are now ongoing in, in Uruguay. Over to you, Kristin. Wow, that's a tall order, my <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, let me start by saying that uh, I think uh, Tor uh, Torbjörn summed up um, his uh, views here very, very neatly. And I really agree with him about starting with the low hanging fruits, because I think that uh, a process like this really needs to see that it's going somewhere so that you, so that everybody gets uh, a sense that uh, there, is, uh, there is movement and, uh, and you can actually achieve something. And I think to your very broad question, I think it's so important to keep talking together because uh, meeting like this and learning from each other is, uh, is simply the best way to, to proceed. And let me just also pick up on, on one of the things that, that I took with me from, uh, from these nuances that we had in the discussions. That was really, really interesting. And I think what we also need to, um, to add to the pile of uh, well, nice things about the top-down uh, approach is actually that uh, this is the kind of treaty that can empower governments because uh, a lot of the uh, developing countries are already well on their way to develop uh, domestic legislation but it's very hard sometimes to enforce it vis-a-vis -vis strong external actors so i think that's another merit of uh, of that approach and uh, it also sort of brings in this idea of leadership by example and I think we have a very good uh, um, example here of uh, plastic pollution, where uh, actually some of the developing countries can uh, wheel this leadership by example, because they have already come such a long way. And, uh, and what is needed then is, uh, is coalition building and uh, continued uh, exchange of uh, experiences and views. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you so much for those, uh, for those final reflections, Kristin. A treaty and how it can empower governments, indeed an interesting topic, maybe for the next report in this series on emerging fault lines. Um, it is, we are uh, out of time, so it only remains uh, for me now to close the event. Would like to really thank all the speakers here in the room and also online for giving, sharing their wisdom and giving us a, a rich discussion. A special thanks to Lars here in the corner of the room from Grid Arndal for all his organizing and making this um, event possible. Thanks also for those of you in the audience here in the room and those that joined us um, online. I know that many of you have a busy morning ahead of you here in Punta del Este. The uh, meeting uh, is uh, scheduled to start again, I believe, in about 30 minutes. And just to let you know that shuttle buses stand ready to take you back to the conference center. So with that, just say thank you and goodbye.